of um, they bother everybody when they ring, but also they for some reason interfere with the recording. So when your when your cell phone gets some sort of like radio connection, it interferes with our recording. So um, that would be very helpful to not to not have that happen. Perhaps because they use similar uh, similar frequencies. Whatever the whatever the reason, it is. So um, <laughs> the um, the topic of discussion today is Judaism and the death penalty. And the reason why I wanted to discuss this, obviously, is because very recently um, there was a, a botched execution here in the United States, in Oklahoma, that just went totally wrong. And it, you know, it got a response from the President of the United States of how distressing and disturbing that kind of thing is. And so, therefore, I thought, let's have a discussion about what does Judaism teach about the death penalty? Is it, is it a moral option? And does Judaism really have anything to say vis-a-vis -vis a criminal system that's not based in Judaism? Like, do we have, does Judaism say anything about, do we have any input whatsoever religiously um, on what the judicial system here is in the United States, for example? Do we have something to say about that? So, let's just think about it and start to talk about it. Any time and I'm sure that you're all familiar with this, and it's the first source that I have on your sheet here, any time there is a discussion about the death penalty and Judaism, Jewish law, this Mishnah, which is in the tractate called Makot of the Babylonian Talmud, is always quoted. Now let's look what this Mishnah teaches. A Sanhedrin, everybody know what a Sanhedrin is? Yeah. The Sanhedrin was the supreme court of the, uh, of the Jewish legal system. The Sanhedrin, that supreme court that executed, and, only, and by the way, the supreme court, the Sanhedrin is the only court in Judaism that can actually meet out the death penalty. Not a a, a um, district courts, uh, no matter where they are, cannot mete out the death penalty in Judaism, only the Sanhedrin, only the, only the Supreme Court, which had 71 members. So a Sanhedrin that executed more than one person in a week is called a murderous court. That's the first opinion of the Mishnah. Rabbi Elazar ben Azaria states, you remember him from the Passover Seder? He's, he's a prominent figure in the Passover Seder, Rabbi Elazar ben Azariah. He states, more than one person in 70 years would be denoted a murderous court. Rabbi Tarfon and the famous Rabbi Akiva state, if we had been members of the Sanhedrin, no defendant would ever, been, would ever have been executed. So we see, we see that Judaism in its very core, is of two minds regarding capital punishment. On the one hand, the reason why we're addressing this in the first place is because it is clear from the Torah that there are crimes that are punishable by death. It's clear. And on the other hand, it is clear from the Talmud that we want to make it as difficult as possible to actually meet out in a practical way any capital punishment. That Rabbi Elazar ben Azari would say a court over a 70 year period would aim to not conclude and to confer the death penalty even once in every 70 years, 
is probably a mistake. <coughs> and Rabbi Akiva and Rabbi Tarfon say, we would never have allowed it to come to that conclusion. We would never have decided on the death penalty for any defendant. So it's interesting that Judaism really is, in theory and in practice, really of two minds when it comes to understanding the death penalty. What I did not quote for you here in the Mishnah is, a, is the final word, which was, which was the word by Rabbi Shimon ben Gamliel. And he wrote that if they allowed, if we allowed Rabbi Tarfon and Rabbi Akiva, their, their opinion, what would be? They would increase the murders in Israel. So if we were to allow, if we were to allow the court system to never, to never meet out the death penalty, it would create a situation where murder and other capital offenses would be ignored. Meaning that people would discount them as far as their gravity. Oh, I could get away with it. They're not going to kill me anyway. So Rabbi Shimon ben Gamliel says, we can't allow this kind of thing to happen. So this Mishnah really is grappling with a very tough idea that, that every society every culture, every legal system has to deal with, has to understand, do we protect human life by creating a legal system, a process within the legal system, within the law, that takes life? Do we protect human life through the process of taking life? And that's something that we have to discuss. So in order to understand the, the, the full answer to that question, we have to look at the next Mishnah that I've, I've quoted for you here. The Mishnah is in Sanhedrin. It's another tractate of the Talmud. Chapter 4, Mishnah number 5. <coughs> the Mishnah wants us to understand if you look at the narrative of Genesis, if you believe in the creation story, the narrative of Genesis teaches that when God created the grass, all the grass was created. When God created the trees, it sounds like every tree, every bush, every animal, it's like poof, instant population of all things, except for what? The human being. The human being was the only thing created singular. Everything else was created as a population. Only the human being was created singular. So the Talmud asks, it's, it's inquiring, why is the human being created as a single entity in the narrative of creation? And so the Mishnah answers, therefore, humans were created singly to teach you that whoever destroys a single soul, scripture accounts it as if he has destroyed a full world. And whoever saves one's soul, scripture accounts it as if she had saved a full world. So you understand what the, what the Mishnah is teaching us? The reason why the human being was created as a single entity is to prove to everyone that every single individual person is unique and sacred. And if there is one seminal teaching that Judaism has given to the world, even in a world of absolute chaos, of the ancient world of child sacrifices, to even a modern world of ethnic cleansing and holocausts, Judaism has always taught the world the seminal teaching that every individual human life is sacred and unique. As the Mishnah finishes by saying, therefore, each and every one is obliged to say, for my sake, the world was created. Every person has the right to say, the reason why this world was created was for me. Because every individual 
is ultimately infinitely important, sacred and important to this existence. So it's very clear that we want to teach people that we don't take human life lightly. What's interesting about this teaching here in this Mishnah in Sanhedrin is the context by which the Mishnah is taught. This Mishnah is taught in the conversation about capital punishment. Why? In order to scare the witnesses, to put awe and fear into the witnesses so that they will be truthful. So that they will understand that if they, in their testimony, put this person to death, it is as if they have destroyed the entire world. And if it's false, and they're doing it falsely, and it's incorrect, they're destroying a whole world for nothing. So this teaching here in this Mishnah was on purpose to instill a sense of awe and fear in every capital witness so that they won't take another human life lightly. Now what's interesting in understanding this concept is, is knowing that Judaism in its capital punishment clauses and laws teaches that there, have, that there are procedural responsibilities in affirming the guilt of the defendant. Two incontrovertible witnesses who not only saw the crime, but they saw each other. If they didn't see each other, if they didn't see another witness who can testify to the same action, there's no, no witness testimony. The witnesses not only have to see the crime, they have to see each other. They have to warn the perpetrator of what they're about to do and the punishment that he could possibly face by doing such a thing. They have to have a certain mental capacity. There are all sorts of procedural elements that go into a capital punishment case in Judaism in order to have some very high level, <coughs> pardon me, <coughs> of certitude of the guilt of the defendant. Okay. And these procedural safeguards are necessary and it's important to keep them in mind when we discuss how Judaism would understand our laws, the Torah laws, vis-a-vis -vis a civil criminal system, a non-Jewish criminal system like we live in, here in the United States. Now there is a caveat I'd like, to, I'd like to say that as in all Torah discussions, there will not be a conclusion necessarily through what we're going to talk about today, mainly because Judaism, Jewish law, is a very fluid legal system that takes into consideration competing values because that's the nature of being and living in the human element. There are competing, there are multiple and complex competing values in every person's life and in every situation that the Torah, Torah law, and the judges of a Sanhedrin or a Beit Din have to consider before they come to a conclusion. So we're going to sort of oversimplify uh, in a liberal way, meaning we're not going to come to an oversimplified conclusion, but we're going to come to some level of understanding about how Judaism is of two minds when it comes to capital crime and capital punishment. Okay. And, and again, keeping in mind that at its heart, Judaism wants to uphold the notion of the sacredness and the uniqueness 
of every individual life. <coughs> so what of Jude, Jude, Judaism's involvement in a, in, a, in a practical way in our system of law here in the United States? Do we count? Does the, the, does the Torah or any of our commentaries, any of our rabbis, address address uh, the relationship between Jewish law and common or civil or criminal law in a, in a country that does not espouse or even or, or consider Torah or Jewish law? What do we do about that? What do we do with it? Do we have an opinion? Should we advocate as Jews for a criminal capital system or not? And that's really the question. We could talk, I mean, there's a, the, whole, the whole tractate of Sanhedrin and the Talmud talks about the death penalty. We could talk for years and years and years and years about fine, the, fine, the fine remarks and ideas that are contained within the discussion of how Jews and, and halacha deal with the death penalty. But practically speaking, how does it impact how we view our lives here in the United States and whether or not as Jews we should, we should uphold and advocate for capital punishment or not? Is it moral or is it immoral? So, I'm sure you're familiar that there are, in Jewish law, there is something called the seven Noahide laws. Do you know what these are? Do you know what this means? It means, that, it means that the Torah insists that Gentiles live according to a set of prescribed laws, seven specific laws. One of those laws is to create a legal system. A legal system that presumably, because there are certain laws within the Noahide laws that are capital offenses, even according, even according to the Torah, um, there, are, there, are, there are offenses, there are crimes, within the Gentile world through the Torah's perspective that are capital offenses. And therefore, there has to be within the non-Jewish world a legal system that will mete out the death penalty when the situation or the case arises or it's needed. So not only are there capital crimes for Jews within the Jewish system, Judaism teaches that there are capital crimes for non-Jews in their legal system, too. So, it sounds as if it's all fine. Let, right, let's, let, <coughs> let every state have a, have a system of capital punishment for every capital crime. And Judaism says they're doing the right thing because... Non-Jews have to have a system of law that governs their behavior, their communities, that includes capital punishment system as well to address the capital crimes. So we have to, we have to understand um, if, if it's so cut and dry. If you look at, uh, at the next source that I have here on this page, by Rabbi Moshe Feinstein. He's a very popular and um, <coughs> extensive writer on contemporary topics that traditionally observant Jews would face in the United States. And he writes like this. It is not possible to adjudicate capital cases except when the Beit HaMikdash is standing and the Sanhedrin of 71 sits in the Lishkat HaGazit. The Lishkat HaGazit. You see, Chamber of Hewn Stones. You know where the, you know where the, you've seen the Temple Mount, the Western Wall? Mm -hmm. You know, there are two sort of domes up there. There's a gold dome and then there's a silver dome. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. One is the Al-Aqsa. One's the Al-Aqsa Mosque and the other is the Dome of the Rock. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> the, the Dome of the Rock is where the Beit HaMikdash stood, the Holy Temple, 
and the Al-Aqsa Mosque is where the Lishkat Hadgazit was, the seat of the Supreme Court, the Sanhedrin. So they were, they were up there, both of them were on the Temple Mount together. So if there's no Beit HaMikdash and there's no Sanhedrin sitting up there on the Temple Mount, writes Rabbi Feinstein, it's not possible to adjudicate capital cases. And he goes on. And that is why we have not adjudicated capital cases even in countries wherein there was permission from the sovereign for the Jews to adjudicate for themselves under Torah law. In Judaism, we do not listen to capital crime cases. We do not impose the death penalty. Even in places where Torah law can be, can be applied and everybody is okay with it, we don't do it. Why? Because there is a connection between the Beis HaMikdash and capital punishment. If there is no Beis HaMikdash, there's no capital punishment. But according to most understanding of what Rabbi Feinstein was saying is that the application of his statement is only in relationship to Jewish law. It has nothing to do with the seven Noahide laws and the laws governing the Gentile communities. The fact that we cannot adjudicate capital cases, Rabbi Feinstein is saying, is we cannot adjudicate capital cases within Torah law. But we can, perhaps, adjudicate capital cases in civil, non-Jewish law. <coughs> As he goes on to say in this very same response. All of this, meaning all of the procedural safeguards and, and the Beis HaMikdash and the Lishkas HaGazis and all these other things, all of this only applies when the prohibition against murder has not been rendered null. What does that mean? Meaning, for someone who murders people because for him the prohibition against murder has become meaningless, and similarly, when the number of murderers has become many, which even though you don't, I mean, we don't, thank God, hear about murders on a daily basis in our neighborhoods, there is within, within Jewish law the, that, that we hear about so many murders happening so often, you know, it would be considered over the top. And this law, according to Rabbi Feinstein, would apply. The number, have, the number of murderers has become so many because people basically think that they're going to get away with it or they just murder for murder's sake, they just ignore. We apply capital punishment in order to deter murder. For this is to save society. So there seems to be a difference in Jewish law between murder and all other capital crimes. Anybody know what another capital crime is in Judaism? Um, Shabbos, that's the Christian. Let's not say that one. Uh. Idolatry. Idolatry. Idolatry is a capital crime. Person not allowed to commit idolatry, specifically in <coughs> to do so publicly. Hello. Hello. <clears throat> would be a person would be a, a, a person would be accused of a capital crime if they were caught doing such idolatrous pagan rituals publicly. There's a difference in Jewish law between murder and idolatry, and that's why Rabbi Feinstein addresses this. Why? Because murder is the destruction of society. And it undoes the very statement that we learned in the Gemara, in the Talmud, that the of the reason why human beings were created in the singular. Murder uproots the sacredness of every individual human life and destroys society. 
idolatry and all the other capital crimes are really between you and God. That doesn't destroy society. It may destroy you spiritually, but it doesn't destroy society. And so Rabbi Feinstein says, in a case where we, where we see a society where murder is rampant, we would overlook all of those procedural safeguards and try capital crimes in order to save society, in order to deter murder. It's an interesting conclusion. Yes. You know, the United States is, is, is interesting in this, in this regard because each state decides for itself whether it's going to uh, have capital punishment or not. Right. So what are the statistics in the states that don't have it versus the states that do? Is it a deterrent? And I don't believe that it is. I believe the states that don't have it actually have the lower murder rate. Right, I understand, and and the truth of the matter is, we're gonna we're gonna sort of touch on that on that concept a little bit because, not necessarily the the statistics. I just saw this uh, just saw this post on Facebook. You know, the, the war on drugs made drugs more available. The war on terror made more terrorists. The war. That's true. Um, maybe we should make a war on money. <laughs> <laughs> Make a war on jobs. War on jobs. War on ethics. What? Maybe ethics. There is a war on money. money. It just hasn't been named yet. So it could be. It could be because I don't know why there's such there. You know the concept of vina hapach. You know, the world does seem to work oftentimes in a in a reverse reaction, um, especially morally so. And we can we can discuss that at another time, but it's po maybe it is possible that uh, that uh, it's not a deterrent in certain states. That doesn't necessarily mean that what Rabbi Feinstein is writing is incorrect. It could mean, and and that's what we're going to discuss right now, is that e even though concluding that halacha, the Jewish law, permits the Gentile world to allow for capital trying capital cases and meeting out capital punishment doesn't necessarily mean that we agree with A, the procedures leading to that conclusion, and B, the, um, the, the, uh, the unfortunate pitfalls and shortcomings. For example, <coughs> the fact that the majority of people on death row repre are, are, are represent mostly racial minorities. So we could argue that there is a that that there's there, there might be again I'm I'm not going to argue this point at all, but we could argue that there is racial bias in the uh, in the criminal system of the United States in which. Only uh, that a large portion of racial minorities end up on death row, uh, and so that would be a shortcoming in the system, and we wouldn't be able to we wouldn't be able to agree with such a procedure. So, um, we're not necessarily saying in Judaism, and it could be that that's that's the reason you know the, the the fact the fact that that every state can make its own law regarding capital cases could just mean that we're so disjointed as far as the way we look at these ideas in the United States and, in, and under criminal law that Judaism could not support that kind of system because there are so many disparities among the state legal systems in this regard. So unless there was a unifying principle of procedure vis-a-vis -vis these crimes, we wouldn't be able, Judaism would not be able to, halacha would not be able to support uh, the use of capital crime, capital punishment uh, in the, uh, the non-Jewish legal system. Does that make sense to you? Yes. I, was, I heard another statistic recently that no less than 4% of the death row population currently in the United States 
based on DNA evidence, and they've, they've, they've sort of worked this out, that at least 4% of the people are, are innocent. Right. Yeah. Right. And that's way too high a percentage as far as we're concerned. 400 people. Yes, that's way too high a percentage as far as Judaism is concerned. And you're absolutely right. That, was, that study was done in, in 2000 uh, that, um, uh, that, that came to the conclusion that there was way too high a percentage of mistakes in, uh, in, in concluding the guilt of these, uh, of these capital crimes. When you say that's way too high, 4%, so that infers that 1% or something isn't too high. I don't, I, I, Halacha wouldn't, doesn't say a specific percentage, but, but the fact of the matter is, is that, you know, but your inference is that one, a 1% one one. occurrence of something, if it's a disease, for example, in, you know, if, if we're talking about the National Institutes of Health, for example, if there was a disease that affected 1% of the population, they would call that a, uh, um, um, an, an epidemic. It's 1% that affects a population in that in that regard. It's, one, it's, one. it's too much. We 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 have to address the problem if it's affecting if it's affecting one percent of the population, right? That's when things go into full gear. It becomes an epidemic when one percent of the population is afflicted with a malady. So if we would use that as our litmus test, you're right. One percent of a mistake in this regard is too high. Isn't and according to Rabbi Tarfon and Rabbi Akiva, one mistake in itself is too much. That's and that's what the Mishnah was saying. That's what the Mishnah is saying. One mistake is too much. And that's why we need to have these procedural safeguards. And so therefore, in really, really to conclude uh, that, that this section of the conversation, what Judaism would sort of insist in, in supporting the death penalty in a, in a civil system such as the one in the United States we, we'd have to make sure that there was a system of, like I've said, procedural safeguards to ensure to a very high level of certitude that this person is guilty. But no system is perfect. No system is perfect. But Judaism teaches, again, that we have to have two witnesses, two eyewitnesses who have seen each other, who have who have informed the defendant of his role, of his, of his punishment. Uh, they have to have a certain mental capacity. There has to be a, a system of very strict cross-examinations, and if they falter in any way, we dismiss their testimony. Whether it's the procedural uh, uh, safeguards of, the, of, the, of Jewish law or, some, uh, or of the civil criminal law, there must be those procedural safeguards in place. Otherwise, Judaism would teach that the death penalty is immoral because there is too many shortcomings, too many mistakes. You were going to say something? Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> but say something is that, is that if, if you have to have these two witnesses, they have to, they have to see each other, they have to warn the person. So, so I mean, if someone's For the about, death penalty. Yeah, for the death penalty, right? I mean, for, but also for any other kind of, uh, of, of, uh, of, of sin as well. You know, capital people, crime, yes. Capital crime. So, so does that mean that that that, that Judaism does not want to uh, does not want to execute anybody because people do these kinds of things without anybody else uh, watching? Don't think people who are perpetrators sort of like do these things, uh, uh, you know, when no one else is around or something like that, or just you know? I mean, I mean I don't, I, I'm not sure exactly what you're asking. I, I mean, maybe if you. I mean, is it like for, exa for example, for Maimonides teaches, it? Maimonides addresses an issue, for example. What if you know for certain that the person is a murderer? You have it on film. Some controversial evidence. You have it on film. But there were not two eyewitnesses who saw each other and warned him. What do you, what do, you do? You just let the guy walk? No, you don't let the guy walk. According to Maimonides, that person goes to jail, but not, not jail with, with recess and uh, three square meals a day. Jail, in Maimonides' terms, for someone who is a known murderer, but cannot be proven through these procedural safeguards, 
is put into jail and is actually, he dies there. Now, I'm, I, I really don't want to discuss, I don't want to discuss, because it's way too, it would be way too long a, of a discussion now, but he essentially dies of malnutrition. We do not feed him. Right, who is this again? Someone who... Someone who there is absolute certainty that he or she murdered a person. Uh-huh. You have it on film. There is no discrepancy whatsoever. But there were not two eyewitnesses. Uh-huh. You see, the, you see the perpetrator's face. You see him shooting the gun. You know he did it. There is no doubt in, <coughs> in anyone's mind. Maimonides says that person goes to jail and he is not fed. But isn't that capital punishment? You need food to live. I mean, you're just saying, we're going to kill you slowly. We're not saying, you know, I mean, that's capital punishment. It's not it, it, whether, whether it, I, I kill you instantly or I kill you, you know. Right, so, so there, obviously there would be a, there's a difference in Jewish it's law. It's also cruel and unusual punishment, which goes against our system. You, you, right. the, you're, you're, again, I, I don't want to get into this whole discussion. It's, it's true that starvation, even in the Talmud, is considered cruel and unusual punishment. It's not, not allowed, according to the Talmud, to allow someone. You're not allowed to let someone starve to death. Right? It's part of, if you remember, at, w at one Google uh, event that we had, we spoke about uh, the Affordable Care Act, where, you're, where, where Judaism teaches that you actually have to force feed someone. Right? You, you must, you must take charge of another person's life and care. Right? The society has to uphold other people's lives. So if a person says, I'm never going to eat again, it's, it's Jewish law that you force feed them, or you strap them down, force feed them through IV, whatever it takes, so that he'll eat. Why? Because starvation is one of those cruel and unusual punishments that you're not allowed to, not allowed to let happen <coughs> to someone. Except, except, for someone who's a known murderer, and there's incontrovertible, or incontrovertible evidence that he is a murderer. That person, we can't put to death with our hands. And so we allow nature to take its course. Ah. Also, I mean, clearly um, a Jewish legal system believes in like godly punishment. Yes. So if someone is let off the hook by the legal system, isn't the understanding that there will be like a heavenly or spiritual punishment for that person? Therefore, it is out of our hands and it's in God's hands. You're end. absolutely right. And in general, that's what we would conclude, except for a known murderer. As Maimonides and Rabbi Feinstein explained to us, murder is a different sin. Murder destroys society. Also, murder goes, go, against, it goes against everything that we believe in about the sacredness of human life. And therefore... It's an exception to the rule. So is there any room for tshuva then? Or? There is no tshuva for a murderer. The only tshuva a murderer can do is to die. And that's the reason why he's put the mishmar in jail and just allowed to die. I thought he's fed some kind of, uh, of, of, of grain or something like that until his belly explodes. Oh, that's for like the woman who like they say. No, that's not the sota. No, yeah. it's not the sota. That's the. There's something where he's fed this, this, dry bread. I forgot what it was, but but then is then he just. Okay, know. so whatever whatever the situation is, we don't, again we don't have to get into all of the particulars, <laughs> of uh, of his of his sentence. Well, so. we're, we're 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 speaking in generalities here. Uh, Essentially, essentially, he dies of malnutrition in prison, and we allow him to die. Why? Because he's a murderer, and murder is a separate sin from all other capital crimes. So, generally speaking, we believe in the divine intervention, and if, and if the court can't prove guilt, then we, quote-unquote, have to rely on God to take it from there. Except when it comes to a known murderer, and that's when we allow we allow this 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 unusual punishment to occur. Yeah, just it's I'm thinking of the different levels that we have in, in the American system. You have murder one, you have um, manslaughter, you have yes. you know mur you know premeditated, non premeditated. There's all these different levels, mm -hmm. right? Of 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 you know 
you know, are, are, do you have a sniper who's just, you know, a sociopath, you know, murdering? Do you have an instance where, you know, like they had the other day with somebody over a parking spot, which was not premeditated, obviously. You know, so there's all these different levels. Right. Mm -hmm. um, In Judaism, it seems to me that there are only two levels. There's the premeditated and the non-premeditated. So whether it was an accident or it was a fit of anger, it would be considered under the same umbrella. But an accident is, is something totally entirely different. No, not necessarily, not within Jewish eyes. An accident means that you weren't careful. But then you also... Um... Right, the Talmud gives the example of you're chopping wood and the axe head slips off of the handle and nails someone in the, in the back of their head. You, you're, 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 you're a killer. You're, you're a killer. You're a manufacturer of the axe. It, but you should have checked. You should have checked. You were irresponsible. Class action losses. You were, you were irresponsible. It's, not, it's no longer a matter of, oh, let your insurance company will call my insurance company. You're, you're a killer. You're a killer because you were irresponsible. That's the conclusion of the Talmud. Right? That, person is, that person is called an, is guilty of manslaughter or non-premeditated murder and has to go to an ear miklat. A, a safe haven until we again we don't have to get into this whole concept but the, the safe haven called Ir Miklat until the Kohen Godel the high priest dies otherwise he can be killed by any close relative of the person who died but that's with anyone in non-premeditated murder premeditated murder is a, is a, is a capital punishment so that's the there are only two there's only one one dividing line there as far as I could tell in halacha. Uh, and uh, whatever. whatever. Anyhow, so, so really in conclusion, <coughs> Judaism, Judaism, cannot, Ju Judaism cannot abolish the concept of the death penalty altogether because it is clear in the Torah that there are things that are deserving of death both within the Jewish world and in the non-Jewish world, there are capital crimes. So we can't say the death penalty is immoral, unethical, because the Torah obviously believes that it is moral and ethical, depending on the crime. But on the other hand, we cannot uphold a system of, 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 of criminal punishment as far as capital crimes are concerned, when there are huge gaps in the procedural system that, uh, that allows for too many mistakes. So, are we concluding anything here? Uh, as usual, not really. As usual, not really. You know, the procedural system is fine until it goes wrong. <laughs> so, so, anyone would argue the system works until something like happened in Oklahoma where it got bungled. And others would right. say, well, that's Oklahoma's mistake. Right. And I don't know which other states are doing in this country. But um, our procedural system's fine. So, you know, you don't know the system's wrong until, unfortunately, someone's... Well, again, the, the, the Oklahoma system was actually not whether he was guilty or not. It was a bungled no, was yeah. kill. It was a mis right. The, the the whole procedure before the procedure was a problem. So I'm saying, but they didn't. That, but, but presumably, up until that point, they were of the view, and presumably other cases as well, that their procedure was absolutely fine and worked. So it was only now when it went wrong, like anything in life, you realise the system doesn't work. You're you're absolutely right. However, in in light of the fact that there have been studies, and not just individual studies, obviously it could it could be that this man was guilty. I don't, I don't well, know. I don't know if he was guilty or not. But the fact of the matter is, is that there, there, there is within our system a known percentage of mistakes. And that we have to be extremely careful about. We, that we have to, we, we really do have to say enough. And uh, there probably, according to Halakha, should be a moratorium on, on, on meeting the death penalty until there can be some level of these, uh, of these safeguards in, uh, that, are, that are unified across the board within the United States 
to, uh, you know, it could be that only, only within the states that allow for the death penalty should there be unity in these safeguards of, uh, of, of certifying guilt. But one way or other, that has to happen. Otherwise, uh, to put someone to death is uh, destroying a whole world. Yes. Well, so what happened exactly in Oklahoma? The procedure that they used to kill this person went wrong. So the lethal injection or whatever they used. Yes, the okay. lethal injection was... There was a whole course of events that went wrong. That, <coughs> that ultimately as well went wrong with his injection, but it started going wrong before. Right. How did you know that? What, what went wrong before that? Uh, it was all in the newspaper, something about his meal, he tried to mm. escape. They tried right. To, every, you know, I mean, this guy, I think I read, he, sh he sh raped and shot or, or something. I mean, it wasn't whether he was guilty, it's the procedure that went wrong. Right. We're not arguing here that Bam was guilty. He could have very well been guilty and deserved the death penalty, as far as I'm concerned. I but it, it, was a, it was an interesting well, was springboard jarring, to having the discussion. It was sort of a jarring event that I think you have to, <coughs> yes. to re-examine. It, definitely, the, it definitely forces people to re-examine whether even doing this in the first place is something that's an ethical procedure. Again, Judaism would teach that under the right circumstances, the death penalty actually is the only, the only repair service, so to speak, the only tikkun that a person can make. Right? The reason why the death penalty is implemented in Judaism is because we believe in God and we believe in a divine system of justice. And the Torah teaches us that in order to repair the damage that you've caused as a murderer, the only way to repair that damage to your neshama is to die, is to be put to death by the court. It's the only remedy... Is that, does that punishment render your soul, like, after death, like, at peace? At some, at, in some level. Obviously, a person has to do tshuva, too. They have to, <clears throat> yeah. they have to do tshuva believe, right? They have to have a heart-sensed tshuva as well. They have to regret their action. It's not just the same way as, same, same way as we learned that Yom Kippur, to a certain degree, also atones for a person's sins. They don't atone for the sins that are between man and man unless you've already created some sort of regret for those things yourself and you've you've tried to remedy the situation so to hear the the full the full blown uh, procedure of chuva for a murderer is to have regret etc and also to die does it say how it's supposed to be done <coughs> yes <coughs> there there are a choice death penalties in the Torah. Hmm. There's okay. skila, which is stoning. There is um, uh, by the sword. Uh, skila, hereg, chenek, what is the other one? Strefa. Strefa, burning. There's several, several options available. And the, the Torah actually, uh, in some cases, uh, defines which of the specific death penalties is associated with a specific crime. Didn't they just get stoned in the Sedra just last week? Yes. <coughs> yes, we had a stoned person Who was that? In the, uh, in, the, in the Torah portion this week for blaspheming. Yeah. Is that theoretical or it actually, it actually happened? <coughs> it seems like it actually happened. And that's the, that's the reason, of course, that we, we try to put fear in the minds of the witnesses because it's the eyewitnesses who actually have to you know how you know how in the in the capital system here like in the lethal injection people there's an audience and they watch the person be killed by the prison systems physician or something well Judaism would teach that the witnesses have to do that the people who condemn the person to death are the ones whose whose hands have to be on the the, f the switch of the electric chair. They have to meet the judgment, and, and that's part of the process of putting fear into the witnesses. It, it's not just to sit back and watch. It's your hands are going to be on this, and uh, you have to. Be, you better be pretty sure of what you saw. Do you refuse? There's no. There is no refusing. <coughs> 
There is no refusal. Uh, they would discount, if they refuse, they would discount their yeah, testimony. You know, there's an interesting thing about, you know, reason of insanity in the United States, where if they decide that somebody was insane when they did murder, then, you know, in a state where they have capital punishment and they don't apply the capital punishment, it, There's you know, no punishment applied to people who are in a state of uh, outside of reality. So and someone who has a someone who is a, who's, who's, who's a psych, who is a psychotic and someone who's a, who has a psychosis is uh, is exempt from all of Jewish legal proceedings. So even in Judaism, we also we apply that. We don't we don't blanketly apply it. Uh, it has to, meaning it has to be a proven fact. Right. Judaism teaches that every time anyone does a sin, nichnas bo ruach shtus, he had a moment of temporary insanity. Judaism concludes that every time a person does the wrong thing, the conclusion is you must have been insane. Otherwise, you wouldn't have done that. Nobody wants to do the wrong thing, is the conclusion of Jewish law. And so you must have been temporarily insane for having done that wrong thing. So we don't blanketly apply the temporary insanity clause because every sin is accompanied with some level of temporary insanity. So when it comes to capital crimes, <coughs> it, have, it would have to be a, um, you know, we'd have to have one of those expert witnesses or, uh, you know, uh, come to a real scientific conclusion that the person was not in a state of reality, didn't know what he was doing. But again, if we, conclude, if we can conclude that, even if we can conclude it, and he's not temporarily insane, we wouldn't meet out the, the, the capital punishment because the witnesses have to inform the perpetrator of what he's doing. They have to say, you fire that gun, you're going to be guilty of murder and go to, and, and die. Meaning he has to, not only do we have to assume that he knows what he's doing, but we have to assume that he was actually informed of what he was doing. Otherwise, there is no capital punishment. <coughs> Anyhow, thanks for listening to me today. Yeah. <coughs> I'm sorry if, uh, sorry if the cough got in the way. I might have sounded like I was all choked up.